Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. Welcome back to our podcast. I'll start this one off by saying that it might not be for the faint of heart or stomach. Even though we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of the topic, we're not shy about discussing some difficult ethical questions. And since meat is a part of our food supply, the animal's life and death and use is a topic worth asking about. Even if you're okay with the idea of eating meat, there are all kinds of questions that pop up. Why do we eat some animals and not others? Why do our choices seem to be completely lacking in a uniform methodology as to what's okay and what's not? In the U.S., why do we eat cows but not horses or dogs? We eat pigs and goats and squid and octopus, which are supposed to be pretty smart, so that criteria doesn't track either. Even in the animals we do eat, there are parts that most of us turn away from when the rubber hits the road, unless they're regional specialties. We eat the muscles all the time, but not the brains or the guts. During the Great War, we turned up our noses at organ meat, for the most part, even though there was rationing here like mad. All of this seems to be changing a bit here, as we adapt to the new cultures that bring new foods and delicious preparations to our shores, and international cooking videos from across the world that are now immediately available anywhere, of course. Still, you have to ask yourself, what is it that causes us to shy away from discussions about our meat? Now I'm going to use a word that can have some horrible connotations attached to it. Butcher. That word has been used throughout history to describe many less than pleasant processes and a few less than pleasant people. But the traditional version of a butcher is not always the thing you might immediately assume. A butcher can be the one that actually takes the animal's life, whether it be on a high production line in a facility or in a small farm backyard. It can be the one that reduces it to smaller usable parts, either at the slaughterhouse or somewhere down the line. It can be the person who takes the side of beef or ham off a truck and starts creating steaks or hamburgers for the customer at the meat counter. It can be the one that preserves the meat through smoking or curing. And it can be all of those things on a big scale or a small one. But the thing they all have in common is that they're part of a long-practiced profession and they ply their trade all over the world. There are many forms and specialties, in addition to the one that we mentioned. And the next time you enjoy sausage gravy, smoked bacon, or a salami plate, you can thank a butcher. I'm not a Portlandia watcher, but I have seen the first episode. It's the one where the couple sits down in a restaurant and starts with a simple question about the chicken on the menu. And the conversation ends up with a life history of poultry in Portland and a visit to a farm. And no, I don't know when you've gone too far down that particular road, but I think I may have traveled it a ways from time to time. Now that we've brought up Portland, Oregon, I have to talk about the food. I don't know if you've ever been to that wonderful city, but it's pretty much one of the farm-to-table food meccas of the known universe. We've been there many times now, and pretty much half the trip is planned around the new food spots we're going to try. Grain and Gristle was the new restaurant we tried on the last trip, and we went back the next day just to make sure it was as good the second time. Absolutely to die for. The nice thing about Portland is that they don't look at you like you're nuts when you ask about the source of food. In most cases, they print the name of the source farm on the menu items, so you can look it up for yourself if you want, or ask the waitstaff, who almost always know the answer to that question without having to ask the chef. So Portland is a great place to have our next podcast conversation because it's the home base of Camus Davis, founder of the Portland Meat Collective and the Good Meat Project. Their organizational goal is to change the way people think about their food and their community and to bring farmers, chefs, butchers, and consumers together to bring about responsible and sustainable meat choices. Camus and her peeps have been at this for over a decade and they brought foodies across the country into a new way of thinking about the animals we use and how we use them. 
They've come up with new ways to prepare parts we didn't think about using, and they do it in a delicious, hands-on fashion. As all of those who have sat at a table for one of the amazing experiential learning classes can tell you. And they do it using animals from local farms in a responsible way, start to finish. And as a girl who really enjoys a delicious, guilt-free steak, thank you, Green and Gristle. I can appreciate that. We hope you enjoy a candid, but not too detailed, conversation with the amazing and accomplished Camus Davis. I'm Camus Davis, the Executive Director at the Good Meat Project. Please tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I wasn't in this world of meat forever. Um, I used to be a magazine editor and a food writer. and. When I was writing about food for magazines, I noticed that whenever I uh, wrote a story about meat, a cut of meat I liked, or um, where it comes from, or a, a dish at, for a restaurant review, if I dug deeper into where that cut came from or why it tasted the way it tasted, I couldn't get very far. Um, at the time, chefs weren't really doing whole animal butchery. Um, so could often not tell me where, what, what part of the animal the cut came from. Um, most chefs were buying meat from distributors who were buying meat from large uh, factory farms three states over. So to get any detailed or nuanced information about those dishes was, was quite difficult, whereas talk, asking someone about a tomato or a banana was a lot easier. Um, and then also just from a uh, not so much a journalistic point of view, but um, a personal point of view. I had grown up in Oregon hunting and fishing with my dad and grandpa. Um, then I'd been a vegetarian when we moved into Eugene, Oregon. Um, and then I became a food writer and started eating meat again, uh, not really sort of thinking about where it came from. So I'd been kind of on all aspects of that spectrum, but always felt a little uncomfortable with the way the majority of meat I ate got to my table. Um, so in 2009, I decided I wanted to explore whether it was possible at all to eat meat well, to um, source it from places other than factory farms, um, and, if, and if there were farms I could source it from, what would acquiring the meat from them require of me? And I set out to learn all about that. I specifically wanted to learn whole animal butchery and charcuterie and utilization and asked lots of places around um, Portland, Oregon, if there's anywhere I can learn that sort of thing. There wasn't. Um, so I ended up going all the way to France and um, studying and living with a, a, fa a family who ran a vertically integrated pork operation there. Um, so they, like all of the big um, conglomerates that sort of own the meat production system in America, they too um, owned, they grew the grain to feed their pigs, they owned, a, they cooperatively owned a slaughterhouse with other small farmers, they did all of the cutting themselves on their farm, they grew all their pigs themselves, they sold it all at outdoor markets, so they owned every part of that process, um, <clears throat> and so I was able to see every part of the process of how one gets that, um, that meat to the table that is not uh, factory farmed, and that sort of sent me on the road I'm on now. Would you explain, please, the process of vertical integration? The four major meat conglomerates that exist in America, the four major companies that, that produce meat for us, um, are vertically integrated in the sense that they own, in some way, shape, or form, whether they're contracting out or they actually do it themselves, um, they own all of the processes that get that meat to our table. So. Um, they're growing the grain, or they have a they own a company that grows the grain. They own the slaughterhouses. They run the slaughterhouses. Um, they s mostly own the farms where the animals are being raised, um, and they even sometimes own the retail outlets where that meat is sold. Um, in the case of the Chapelards, the the family of pig farmers and butchers that I studied with, they also owned every part of the process, but they were well outside of that um, industrialized meat production model. And so in some ways they had sort of taken, taken back this, um, this tool, I guess, for lack of a better word, that you know, large capitalist um, companies have utilized in order to control the system and sort of re rethought it for themselves so that they could actually make money, live a middle-class lifestyle, 
um, work really hard, but, um, but really have control over that product and over the processes. And sorry, the other thing I'll say, most vertically integrated companies have very clear divisions of labor. So anyone working at the slaughterhouse isn't going to see the farm. Anyone working at the farm isn't going to see the slaughterhouse. Anyone working in retail will never see the slaughterhouse. Whereas the vertically integrated um, butchers and farmers that I worked with did everything. So they actually could control the quality of that meat in a way um, that was very um, intimate and very small scale. Um, and they could tell their customers, well, we did all of the things along the way, so we can vouch for this product. Do you think that makes a difference in terms of how you raise an animal conceptually and intellectually as a farmer? Absolutely, yeah. I think to some extent it, it makes a difference for consumers if they believe that they know these things, that they can go to their butcher or their farmer or their whomever and ask, can you tell me about this product? Whether or not they actually can is a different story. So. One of the things that we've been discussing with our farmers is the niche market concept. So how does that help the small farmer and their market? I think it's all about story. I think figuring out what consumers, I'm gonna do a Rumsfeld here, <laughs> figuring out what consumers know they don't know and what they don't know they don't know <laughs> and figuring out what they want to know is a really tricky game for small farmers. Um, and and their story has to figure that all out in order to bring the consumer in. Um, so it, in some cases it is just a matter of, oh, you know, this animal was raised on pasture. That does it for some consumers. For other consumers it's, this animal was raised on pasture, but end, not a but, but an end, they were slaughtered humanely. For other customers it's, they were slaughtered humanely and this meat was handled by artisan producers, you know, so it depends on who that consumer is and what they need from you. Um, hopefully that story is true. It not, al it not always is. In fact, there are now huge grocery stains that you, uh, huge grocery chains that utilize those same stories, even if they're not necessarily true. Um, so that's a challenge. It's a challenge for farmers to distinguish themselves um, and to make those stories true. And what is the safest bet for determining whether or not that story is true in your experience? I mean, the safest bet, and I try to encourage all of our students and, and the audience at any of our events or workshops, is to ask so many questions <laughs> that eventually you can tell who's lying and who's not, you know? Um, to not take those labels that we've grown used to at their word, whether it's sustainable or local or humane or organic, you know, knowing and being educated that those are pretty general labels um, and that there's um, intricate stories behind those labels, I think is important. And I, we're not taught to do that as consumers in America. And so we really try to teach our students to ask those questions. I mean, my test when I go to a farm <clears throat> or I call a farmer up is, to say, I need, I need three, uh, three hundred and uh, three two hundred pound sides of pork um, in five days from now. Could you deliver those for me? And if they say yes, I know that um, that they're probably co-packers who are buying um, commodity pork from three states over and selling it under their under their name. So if they can't produce what you want in a way, that's good. It's really good if they tell me it'll be two months from now. <laughs> or I can only get you, you know, 50 pounds of pork shoulder, but two weeks from now I might have more. That reminds me of that first episode of Portlandia where the couple goes into the restaurant and they end up with the life history of the chicken they're about to consume. <laughs> but, it, I mean, that's really interesting. That, that episode is so interesting to me, too, because it brings to light this assumption that we all make, which is that if a chicken is raised on pasture and I know its name, it will taste good and be raised well. And that's not necessarily true, actually. Um, there's a lot more that goes into making that bird taste good and making us feel good about that bird and making that bird's life good as well. Um, and it's not, it's not really that simple, unfortunately. I think that the average consumer has sort of a label fatigue in many ways. 
The assumption is that organic might be fine, but it doesn't have the rest of the things that you might need. But then there's humane standards, and there's breed standards, and do all of these things make a difference? So do you find that all of these things do make a difference, or what makes the biggest difference to you? I think that all of those labels in their most quintessential, true, real form do make a difference but that it's difficult in today's agricultural landscape for farmers to truly achieve those labels as they are meant to be. Um, and so shortcuts sort of sneak in to the equation without farmers even meaning for them to, um, to really, really, truly adhere to what those labels should mean, not what they do mean in the legal world or in the regulatory world. You have to do everything the hard way. I mean, the hard way, it, which is relative to what we think is hard and easy nowadays in the modern times. Um, I mean, I think, unfortunately, the best way to determine the quality, the, the good or bad quality of an animal is, is complicated. But there's no, that it's not just breed, it's not just pasturing, it's not just humane um, rearing or slaughter. It's all of those things at once, that there's this very complex weaving together of all of these processes um, that makes what we like to think of as good meat. Um, and good meat being not just it tastes good, but uh, you know it was raised right, it was raised well, it was raised with the health of the planet and our bodies and the animals' bodies in mind. It's just complicated, unfortunately. It doesn't have to be, but in comparison to how most meat is raised, it just is. If someone asked you what you do and you had to give yourself a title, what would that be? Hmm. Uh, I, I often call myself a meat thinker, which confuses people <laughs> because we're not used to thinking about meat. Um, but that's sort of what I do is to not only think complexly about how meat is produced and how it should be produced, but help other people do the same thing. So you found yourself becoming a butcher, and how did that compare with the French influence? Um, well, with the French, just a note on that, I, with the French I, I did see a very specific style of butchery. They had a consumer base who would buy every part of the animal and did not balk at pig brains or pig ears or blood sausage or heart or liver, any of that stuff, any of what comprises that fifth quarter of the animal that we never like to think about here in America. and so. I came back to America thinking, oh, I'll, you know, I'll just spread spread the gospel of this whole animal butchery style that, that they did over in France and ended up working at a butcher shop, convincing them that they should do whole animal butchery and source from local farms and became very clear that there wasn't a consumer base to support that kind of model. Um, and granted, I and the other people I worked with weren't creative enough to figure that out at the time. There weren't a lot of examples to go by, whereas now there are. Um, but at that point, I realized all the things I want to see happen in the meat production world and in the meat consumption, in the, in the realm of meat consumption, can't happen unless there's a consumer base to support that. And that consumer base needs to be more open-minded. Um, they need to think more complexly about where meat comes from. They need to confront all of the scary stuff that we don't, never want to talk about that gets meat to our tables and realize some of it is scary and some of it isn't. Um, and they need to sort of completely revalue how they think about meat um, and, and how they think about that steak on their table. They need to change how they eat it, how much they eat. It's just a, it's a wholesale rethinking. One of my favorite books is Mary Roach's Gulp, where she talks about the elementary canal, and one of the chapters is on offal, or offal? I don't know what you call it. I say offal, offal? you say offal. <laughs> <laughs> but Mary talks in a humorous commentary. She's talking on uh, some of the, the animal parts that we as Americans will not eat. We find them horrifying. And so we're shipping them off, especially in times like the war. We're living on rationing, and Americans will not eat these foods. We have to ship them overseas. Can you explain the differences between here and there and some of our food habits? Um, where I was in France, this isn't necessarily true in all of France, but where I was, um, 
there was a general knowledge about how to use meat in the kitchen. There was a general knowledge that some muscles, because of the way they had moved during the animal's lifetime, required slow cooking, while other muscles required fast cooking, high temperatures. Um, there was a general understanding that when you use organ meats, um, they're, they're going to require a certain kind of cooking, a certain kind of temperature, certain flavor, flavor profile. They're going to be intense in flavor. And they saw meat, especially those organ meats, as a kind of accent to a meal. It wasn't, we here think of meat as the main course. It's a, there's a big hunk of meat on our plate and everything else is there just for show, more or less. I mean, that's changing, but that's sort of been our tradition. Um, in addition, over time, we've, because our knowledge of cooking and using meat in the kitchen has decreased, we've grown fond of only those things that are easy and fast to cook. And so that really is maybe a quarter of the animal. Um, the rest of the animal, be it muscle cuts or organ meats, take slower temperatures, longer amounts of time. You maybe need to salt it ahead of time. Um, and that just hasn't been incorporated into our mindset about food in this country, um, and especially with organs. And then in addition, we have this story that we've told ourselves for a long time that those those organs, those off bits, the, the, the head especially, um, have come to represent the fact that this was a living being that we had to kill for food. And they are terrible reminders of that. And we don't want to grapple with it. And vegetarianism and veganism exist so that we don't have to grapple with it. And somehow in France and most every other country I've been to, that grappling has occurred. It's always occurring. There's this kind of comfort with the fact that this was a live animal. Now we're eating it for food that we just don't have here. And I think that those offcuts, although the industrial model figures out how to put them into something, um, really remind us of those uncomfortabilities. Talk about the value of life, of food life, if you would. It's a hard concept for us. I think it's a hard one for us because you, I mean, if we ate meat and we were also willing to either be a part of those processes that we're so uncomfortable with, or we were even willing to witness them, or we were even willing to just every once in a while remind ourselves out loud or in our head, an animal had to be killed for this. I just think we would have such a different production of, or a different system of meat production and consumption. We would just be such different eaters. But we've constructed this narrative that sort of exempts us from that equation, therefore makes us not think about it, therefore it allows us to just eat whatever meat comes our way, eat a lot of it, um, and not really think about it, not think about either waste or the processes or, or, or our responsibility within that. Do you think it's necessary for people to go through the process of a slaughter at least once to realize that? I don't think that it's necessary for everyone to witness or slaughter themselves, um, to witness the slaughter or slaughter an animal themselves to realize that. I think there are much easier and uh, less intense ways to realize that. Um, but my experience has been that when people come to our classes and our workshops and they do take part in those processes, something shifts, they become a very different kind of consumer, a very different kind of thinker. And it's a slow process. It's not like immediately everyone becomes a vegan or even ever becomes a vegan, but they start to shift their thinking and their responsibility and they are a part of the system. And maybe I don't want to buy meat from this source. Maybe I want to buy it from this other source. Maybe I don't want to eat that much of it. Maybe I want to eat it once a month instead of once a day. Um, and I think that that sort of nuanced way of of thinking about meat production and consumption doesn't fit into our sort of black and white puritanical way of thinking about meat eating. And um, it's just, again, it's a harder way to think about things. It's, it, it requires more of our brain, <laughs> which our, our brains are big because we eat that meat. So it's very complicated. You know? And again, it would have a benefit to us health-wise if we ate less meat. 
Well, and not just if we ate less meat, but if we ate a different kind of meat altogether. I mean, we have all of these studies coming out saying all red meat is bad, all cured meat is bad. It's, and the kinds of meat that we eat, yes, but there's such a difference between, um, you know, a pasture-raised uh, American guinea hog fed, you know, organic grain grown in the same fields that that uh, pig grew on than a factory farmed pig being fed the same grain, uh, living the same amount of time every, you know, for or living, you know, six months instead of 12 months. I mean, there's, there's such a difference in nutrition and in quality and flavor and texture and all of that stuff. Now, Commercial meat and heritage breed meat or foods don't have to be mutually exclusive, but one of the things that our heritage breed farmers have said is that the meats in heritage breed animals are vibrant and they're much more flavorful than maybe other different breeds. Do you agree with that? I do find it the case that heritage breeds tend to have um, more interesting and complex flavors than uh, commercial breeds. But it also depends on what, I mean, you could feed the commercial breed and the heritage breed the same feed and allow them to live for the same amount of time, and that difference would lessen. So it really, for me, is always about the breed, the relationship between breed, feed, and then the, the movement that the, the movement of the animal, um, whether it's pastured or not, how much it moves during its lifetime. That equation is what makes the big difference to me. When I spoke to you on the phone, we talked about Bob Kennard and Much Ado About Mutton, his great book. And one of the concepts that was raised in that book was the uptake of nutrients and longevity in an animal. And it takes a long period of time for an animal to uptake nutrients. So for a three-year-old animal, that's a long time for it to be running around eating and uptaking of nutrients and depositing them in its body. And that it will lead to a complexity of flavor. Yeah. I guess the, the fourth part of that equation of breed feed and movement is age. Um, and that when you're working with a heritage breed, you're allowing, depending on if it's a ruminant or not an omnivore, but when you're working with a heritage breed, um, you're working with a certain level of feed, a certain amount of movement, growing it out older is necessary. It just, it's not going to, it's not going to work. It's not going to taste as good. It's not going to fully develop its ratio of fat to meat until it grows much older. Um, and that's something that's just sort of completely lost on, on us here in America, I think. And the fact, you know, we, we slaughter all of our animals at a very young age. It's not just lamb. Um, and in fact, lamb is slaughtered at a much older age than people think it is. So, and the reason that we slaughter animals at a young age is that we have a consumer base that over time has wanted mild tasting meat that um, is somewhat moist, easy to cook, fast to cook. Um, we focused on the muscles instead of anything else. We're afraid of fat, which is where all the flavor comes from. And so we've essentially been you know, eating baby or adolescent animals to um, please that very boring palate of ours. <laughs> and with, a, with heritage breeds in that formula I'm talking about of breed feed uh, movement and age, that's just a completely different meat. It's a completely different product. It's um, more concentrated flavor, more fat, which allows for that concentrated flavor. The textures require a different kind of cooking. So you are just, you, that, those, those products require a whole new knowledge or an old knowledge of cooking and of eating that we've lost. And that's the challenge, I think. And yet, culturally, we accept that complexity of flavor in wine and whiskey, for example, through aging, is a good thing, but not meat. Yeah, yeah. I think that we do culturally um, get the idea of complex flavors and value the, the idea of complex flavors in wine and, and cheese and all of these other facets. And people like me and the people that I work with in this realm of you know, meat production reform, for lack of a better phrase, are slowly trying to get that idea about meat into the, the, the general consciousness of the public. 
So here in America, we're kind of, I guess, in our infancy in terms of how we view some types of meat. Uh, we, for instance, we went to uh, the Amish country, and we were talking to a farmer, and he was, he's a person who raises Belgian draft horses. And he said that when he goes to sell his animals in the market, one of the, the biggest markets that buys his big Belgian draft horses is the Japanese, and they buy them for luxury meat. And yet, in our country, we just can't even fathom that. We can't even, uh, can't even imagine eating horses. There are many places in other countries where they eat other types of meat. Have you ever hit anything in another place where you look at it and you say, okay, I'm fine with organ meats, I can eat this or that, but you hit an animal or an object where you say, I just have never even thought of eating that, and I don't know if I can. I think that, you know, the, those cultural narratives that we grew up with about, you know, dogs as pets, horses as revered pets, but also sort of revered heroes of the West, um, majestic creatures, uh, deer as Bambi. I mean, there's all of these narratives that we grow up with that I, I'm not um, saying we should ignore or, or think of as wrong, but we grow up with them and therefore um, it is hard for us to think about, you know, eating a rabbit if we've had a pet rabbit, um, eating a horse if we grew up, you know, riding horses um, or bonding with them. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there, I, I definitely struggle with those narratives. I, I would say, you know, I didn't even grow up riding horses, but I grew up watching, you know, the return of the black stallion <laughs> and reading a horse sounds strange to me. However, I did see horses slaughtered in France. I did see that it that these horses were a part of the agricultural system um, that was set up there. And when the horses got old, they suddenly had a different purpose um, and they were turned into meat. And I respected that. Um, I suppose maybe 20 years ago, I might have balked at the idea of eating a rabbit. But now that I've thought about what are the most sustainable animals to raise for food, now that I've seen rabbits raised for food, now that I've seen rabbits, uh, you know, eating one another and doing horrific things because they're rabbits, uh, I don't think about them in the same way. And I do actually see them as uh, a, a, a potentially very environmentally friendly source of food. But other people do not see it that way and see them as furry pets. And it's just a, it's a hard reconciliation to bridge. I'd like to talk a minute about the USDA and the slaughter facilities in the United States. Because most Americans don't realize what it takes for a hamburger, for instance, to get to their table. Would you talk about that for a minute, please? So the, uh, whenever meat uh, from an animal is going to be sold for any kind of commercial purposes or processes, it is required in the US to have gone through a facility that is USDA inspected. Um, and what that means is that the facility has followed a set of rules and regulations um, that the USDA has set out in order to make sure or ensure that that product is safe for human consumption. The USDA has also allowed for a kind of loophole in that system, which is that if an animal is going to be killed for food for personal consumption, but is not going to be sold commercially or for profit, it does not have to go through a USDA facility. Um, it can go through a state inspected or a county inspected um, slaughterhouse or processor. Those regulations uh, governing those particular smaller slaughterhouses and non-USDA um, processing facilities are much less stringent and, and not necessarily geared towards large production. That said, they're still deemed to be safe processes for the most part. So the USDA regulations, especially governing slaughterhouses and processing facilities, are very much geared towards um, large-scale production. And the USDA gets a bad rap in, in my world, but in some ways those regulations are actually necessary to keep what feels like a gargantuan 
uh, an overwhelmingly large um, system of meat production in check to keep things as safe as they possibly could be. But the problem is that when you have small-scale farm farmers who maybe have you know, a couple hundred pigs a year at most, if not less, wanting to sell commercially their meat, they also have to go through those USDA uh, inspected slaughterhouses and processing facilities. And those facilities have set up their system, um, <laughs> gets complicated fast. They, they've set up their system to adhere to these regulations and it's expensive to do so. So they need to make a certain amount of money back. So they're always going to favor large scale operations. Farmers who can bring in, you know, 500, 1,000, you know, pigs a week not a farmer who has one pig a week and sometimes the pig is 400 pounds and sometimes it's 150. They want you know, a very predictable amount, they want a very predictable size, uh, and that's what those slaughterhouses are built for. So the problem then is when you have these small scale producers trying to get their meat to market, they have trouble even finding a slaughterhouse that will take them. And so many of the farmers have sort of opted out of that system and decided to sort of create an alternative economy of meat, if you will, through that loophole in the USDA regulations, and now will sell a quote-unquote live animal to a consumer for personal consumption um, so that it can go through these smaller processing facilities or so that they can legally have someone come to the farm and do the slaughter themselves. Are there a large number of USDA facilities across the country? Uh, are there a large number of USDA facilities across the country? No, I would say, I mean, yes and no. I suppose someone who didn't know the landscape at all might hear the numbers and think, oh, that seems like a lot. But across the board, there is a, um, there are not enough, essentially, to, to meet the needs of the growing number of, of small farmers, small to medium-sized farmers. So even if you're a farmer that has a large number of animals, if you are uh, quite a ways from the facility where the USDA does slaughtering, you have to ship them to that facility, is that correct? Yeah, I mean that's, yeah, yes, exactly. There, there are few enough USDA slaughterhouses that most farmers have to drive a long distance, um, whether you're large or small, you have to go a long distance to get your animals there. That brings up all kinds of issues surrounding humane treatment of, of animals, um, the stress of the animals at the time of slaughter. Um, it's expensive to drive that many animals that far, so that, that's a barrier as well. So that distance is, is a problem. In your experience, does the stress that's put on an animal in order to ship it to the facility, does that impact the taste? The stress that an animal experiences before um, and during slaughter, and as well that the carcass might experience after slaughter, all affects the taste and, and flavor of the meat. It's very, very important. So this is not just a touchy-feely, be nice to the animal kind of thing? No, it, yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the adventure of the animal from the farm to the slaughterhouse and then beyond into the world of carcasses um, is not only about humane treatment of animals, it's about the quality of the meat. And, yeah. So it might be in our self-interest, do you think? Yeah, if we like meat to taste good, yes. <laughs> it might be in our self-interest. <laughs> Would you say that your perspective on the butchery that you do and the classes that you do is that they're focusing and concentrating on the process as well? Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the point of all of our classes and workshops, be it for a consumer or a farmer or a chef, is to better marry the processes with the end product, to sort of keep that in everyone's heads um, so that we don't have that division of labor or that division of knowledge, that we all kind of possess knowledge about those things and their relationship to one another. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there, you know, when we think about uh, how an animal is raised, how it's treated, how it's slaughtered, um, what breed it, it is, what it was fed, what it ate, how it moved, all of that stuff is in service of both the end product, the flavor, the texture, our enjoyment, and also certain people's notions of, you know, what's good and bad and acceptable and humane and not humane and ethical and all of that. And I think it's important to think about all of those things at once. 
If you had someone that came to you and said, well, you're kind of a touchy-feely, save-the-planet type person, do you have something that you might say to them that you could explain to them why you might integrate your concepts into their cooking experience? How, how would you say that to them? In all of our classes and every conversation I have with anyone about this subject matter, I try to appeal to whomever I'm talking to on both a personal level, a political level, and an, uh, as well as an environmental level and a health level. Um, and certain of those levels work with certain people. At the end of the day, I think our particular culture in this country is more about, well, what can it do for me? Uh, does it taste good? Is it cheap? And beyond that, pretty much, we don't know what to think. And so how do you get people to shift their thinking and say, well, it's not cheap, but I might need to eat less of that not cheap meat in order to keep my level, uh, my economic levels the same, but also my enjoyment levels will go up. That's a slow shift. It's not, it's a long game. It's not something that happens overnight to people. I want to ask you about your program. Tell me about the Eater Feeder Cedar program. So we uh, originally mostly worked towards educating consumers on the basic processes that get meat to the table, um, on what the difference is between a Cornish cross hen and a red ranger, ranger chicken in terms of flavor, but also in terms of texture, how to use the whole animal, all of that sort of thing. We quickly started realizing that in addition to consumers coming to, to classes, farmers, be they new idealistic farmers or old cynical farmers, um, were coming to our classes wanting to learn those basic processes because they didn't have access, they didn't do any of those processes, but also wanting to start thinking about how do I do what I'm doing and market it to the people who are gonna pay for the product I'm raising. And we were getting chefs coming to our classes, be they old cynical chefs or new young ideal, idealistic chefs, who were starting to think about how can I source better meat for my menus? How do I use every part? How do I appeal to that consumer base? How do I disguise the heart in a pate? Or how do I highlight the heart in the pate? So we knew that the kind of transparent hands-on education that we do, which is teaching slaughter, teaching whole animal butchery, teaching whole animal utilization, shifts the way people think, at least consumer-wise. We figured it would work the same for farmers and chefs, but we knew that farmers and chefs had a very different need. Um, they not only needed to know, you know, how do you butcher a whole animal, how do you use every part, how do you tell your consumers, oh, this is what you do with all that fat and pig skin, but, uh, you know, how do you make money doing it? What do you, what challenges do you face in terms of USDA, navigating USDA slaughterhouses, in terms of navigating various regulations surrounding labeling? So we're really trying now to inspire both more responsible meat production and consumption through this kind of education, but customizing that education for each of the audiences. And one of the things you talk about on your website is using things like tongues, tails, heads, and organs. Do you use all the parts? I do. I use all the parts. <laughs> um, we do try to encourage chefs to A, um, purchase whole animals directly from local, small to medium-sized, regenerative, sustainable, humane farms, all of those labels, and to then figure out how do I use every part and make money doing so. And in order to do that, you have to be very creative, at least in America, about how you do that. I mean, I've, I have a story I always tell about a chef, a local chef here in Portland who, on his menu, would always have something called pulled pork, but in quotation marks. <laughs> and, one day, <laughs> uh, and one day I asked him, I was a restaurant reviewer at the time, what is this quote unquote pulled pork? And he said, it's head cheese. But if I called it pate de tete or fromage de tete or head cheese, no one would buy it. So I call it pulled pork because in the end, the cheeks and the jowl and all the meat on the head is sort of the same as the shoulder in that it needs to be slow cooked. Once you do that, it shreds like pulled pork. So what's the difference really? <laughs> so, you know, that's how chefs have to be creative here, unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, I mean, the chefs that we work with who are really excited about doing, uh, incorporating a whole animal program into their, into their restaurant are excited to have to be creative again, to not be buying box cuts 
opening it up, doing the same old thing they always do to, to satisfy the customers. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was the cost. And you've been to the farms and you've seen how these animals are raised, so you understand this. Would you please explain to somebody who says, well, I don't want to pay $10 a pound, talk about the cost. If someone says that they don't want to pay $10 a pound for beef, I will tell them that if they ate the whole animal, the farmer would not have to charge them as much, but because they only want to eat a few of the sort of muscle meats, the loin or the ham or the belly, they don't want to eat the head or the trotter or the skin or the heart, the farmer has all of that either sitting in their fridge or maybe it goes to pet food, but they're losing money on that. So they have to raise the price in order to cover those costs. In addition, I'll say to them, this farmer is using this kind of breed, has this feed program, and therefore has to grow out this animal longer than an industrial uh, breed, which is bred to grow quickly. And therefore, there's more inputs going into it, there's more time, there's more energy, there's more labor, all of that. So therefore, they have to charge you more money. It's how, it's, econ it's basic economics. Um, I'll also remind them that the meat that we eat that is cheap is cheap because of the subsidization of grain, because of the fact that large conglomerates own every part of the process and so therefore have the money to begin with. And that, that cheap price tag is sort of not real. It's, it doesn't really reflect the true cost of meat. It also doesn't reflect the the true cost that we'll face in the future, which is how does that meat production system affect our health, um, the health of the planet, um, what, how will we have to pay for it later? That's invisible to us as well. The other thing I'll say is, if none of that makes sense, if all of these, this talk about the future and climate and the true value of meat and labor doesn't make sense, at the very least, you're paying more for a better product that tastes better, that is better for you. And lucky enough, you don't really have to eat much of it to feel sated because it has stronger flavor, better, more complicated flavors, more interesting textures, lends itself to charcuterie preparations, with, which also concentrates the flavor of the meat. So it ends up kind of balancing out in the end if you're willing to change how you cook meat and how you see meat as a part of your diet. That may feel like a big investment for a lot of people. You know, oh, am I gonna have to make my own ham now? Am I, like, how, I don't know how to slow roast a, you know, brisket. What does that mean? I don't have a smoker. I mean, there's all kinds of things that that might require of people. So it, in some ways, does require a wholesale shift and a cultural shift. Um, but in my experience, the people who take our classes and learn these things and start to revalue all of this end up sort of indulging in those things and, and sort of incorporating those changes into their lives in a way that's satisfying and that they can, and it turns into something they can be passionate about. It turns into a lifestyle that they want to live. So if you had a, either an animal or a breed or a taste or a meal that you said, this is just absolutely fantastic, absolutely your favorite, could you just list one or two of your favorites, please? I, I think generally when I take part in the processes that gets meat to my table, be it helping raise the animal, helping to slaughter it, butchering it myself, salting the ham, hanging the ham myself in, in my garage, it just tastes better. Um, and there are too many examples of that to name just one. Um, I have had some particularly enlightening meals made out of uh, heritage breeds, I mean animals that were pastured, um, animals that sort of lived their normal animal lives and weren't um, factory farmed in any way. Tasting those animals has been a revelation. It's just a completely different meat. It, it looks different, it tastes different, it cooks different. <laughs> If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. 
Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B K Y R D G R E E N F I L M S. Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films, B A C K Y A R D G R E E N F I L M S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is youtube.com Backyard Green Films. We would like to thank Chemist Davis for taking the time out of her busy schedule to sit down and speak with us today. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. If you'd like more information about the organizations that we spoke about today, please visit the Portland Meat Collective at pdxmeat.com and the Good Meat Project at goodmeatproject.org. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.